throwing them over to Maura, my, my esteemed colleague who did the, the beautiful um, archival exhibit, and um, she'll explain our guest and our speaker and uh, all the rest. Thanks. Thanks. Ah, thank you everybody for coming today. We're just so thrilled to see you. There's so many opportunities to do so many other things in Montauk, so thank you for your support. Also, I just want to say very briefly, as the archivist here, and we have the most remarkable collection of photographs, and they've been donated by you, by the people of Montauk, and I'm so proud of this collection because if I didn't know that it was only started maybe 25 years ago, I would think that it began way back before Carl Fisher began to put roots down here. So I just first want to applaud everybody here. Thank you for the great, great of photographs Thank you. The second thing, I'll just go right into it. Um, Anne, I, I first met Anne last year. We've become friends. She's put together a really dynamite, uh, uh, dynamite presentation on the juries. I've also been able to get to know the Duryea's first through the fantastic scrapbook that Lynn Duryea donated. I don't know if Lynn, if you're here. Uh, okay, Lynn, thank you so much. The most fantastic primary source material about the hurricane I've ever read, and it came from Lynn, written by her grandmother and her great aunt, and also, uh, I don't know if Chip is here, but Chip, you've donated some fantastic stuff to us. Great primary source material, great photographs. And this was what allowed Anne to really um, put together, helped her to put together this presentation. Uh, I think probably everyone's heard the story about uh, Chip and Lynn's grandfather driving a tractor with Richard Gil Martin from the East End through high water right after the 1938 hurricane because a telephone man had informed him that everybody was dead and drowning in Montauk. So he leapt right into action, uh, so did Dick Gil Martin, no hesitation, and I think Anne would like to tell us about how this sort of fortitude and strength of character is very typical of Montauk's, has continued to this day, and I think she will elaborate right now. So take it away, Anne. Well, oh, thank you. Also, Anne is writing a book about Perrin B. Durier, the assemblyman, uh, called The Man from Montauk. The expected publication date will probably be in 2019. It's not set yet, but um, her, her wealth of knowledge is vast. So thanks a lot, Anne. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much for coming. You know, uh, my dear oldest brother came, and he's going to tell everybody from now until five years from now that everybody came to see him. So I'm just, I'm just warning you here. But uh, I like to start off with a little something funny, you know, um, because it relaxes me. So this is just a joke that uh, President Ronald Reagan would sometimes start his speeches off with. You know, he tells about this man who would pass a, a little kiosk out on the street in New York City. Well, the woman in that kiosk was selling pretzels. But this gentleman, he would come every day, walk past there, drop a quarter in, and not take the pretzel. Well, this went on, you could almost say a year. Well, one day he did this, and the woman grabbed hold of his arm. She wouldn't let go. And he said, oh, I bet you you're just wondering why I would just drop in the coin and not take a pretzel for so long. You probably want to know about me and my story. She said, no, I don't. I want to inform you that pretzels are 35 cents now. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, okay, chuckles good. All right, so uh, my presentation, as I uh, put here, is a tapestry of fortitude within the Winds War in the Duryea's. Okay, I set the stage in 1920s because that's when the stormy weather actually started uh, in, in, in there, and then the 30s, stormy, and then, of course, the, the war. But in those winds is the hurricane of uh, 38. So I just wanted to set the stage for that. Okay, okay so the Roaring Twenties here in the United States was a good decade, okay? It was uh, the wealth of America had doubled. 
And with that brought a lot of excitement. We had jazz, we had movies, we had glamour, we had silk and satin, and uh, we had good uh, medical advancements. We had insulin and pencil, uh, uh, penicillin. Yes, sliced bread was introduced. And um, so there was this cultural shift, but also in the 20s is when the Dorier's came. So Perry uh, Dorier Sr., uh, a veteran of World War I, after that, he came to Montauk, moved to Montauk, uh, because he needed good, clean, fresh air. Then he met Jane Stewart Tuttle, and they were married January 1920. And then uh, Perry came, uh, you know, October 21 in 1921. So we have that. So if there was a mantra, and every, uh, it, it would have been every morning, every evening, ain't we got fun? Yes, there was fun. There was good hard work, but it was fun. And behind this exciting time, though, in our land of plenty, there was a perilous wind. We couldn't see it. We couldn't feel it, but it was there, growing 4,000 miles away. For instance, 1924, Brigadier General uh, Billy Mitchell sends a report to our War Department saying, it is most likely that Japan will start a war with the United States with a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. Four years later, 1928, Isoroko Yamamoto lectures in Japan's Naval Academy. What on? How to uh, successfully bomb a military port. However, as dark as that news was, there was trouble coming to the United States. It was a different type of trouble, but it was coming from within our own borders. So 1929, August 7th, you know, uh, we went into a recession. But no bells and whistles came, none at all, because the GDP seemed to be okay. So no sirens, no concern, no worries. 73 days later, October 29th, the stock market crashes. Yep, and the United States went into a depression. This is a fearful wind. This is a storm that blew across America. Although not a great number of people invested in the stock market, the effects of the crash were fierce. So in 1930s, the winds of unemployment were crushing, meeting basic needs was a struggle, and dreams were lost or deferred. But the depression hit Montauk hard. Uh, the stock market crash killed Carl Fisher's dream to develop the Miami Beach of the North and Montauk, and many people lost their jobs. And when Richard Gilmartin was asked if he knew Carl Fisher, Gilmartin said, of course I did. I worked for him. We all did. Fortunately, many of Fisher's projects were completed before the crisis, and the Montauk Manor was one of them. And 12 years later, that manor was a fortuitous place for many of Montauk residents. Now, Jean Beckwith Jr. said that the years uh, of the Depression in Montauk were difficult. He still can remember his mom's soup. It was the water that the potato was boiled in. And Eddie Eckert had said that, um, you know, he ran away from home with his mother's help, of course, because he couldn't stand to eat card, not one more day, not one more time. I'm going. She said, well, all right. So she helped him pack, and he walked to the railroad station, and he sat, and he waited. And he sat a little more, and then he walked home. No. No. And then uh, Jean also shared some more memories. And the fishermen's off season, the highway department would offer the men two weeks of work for $4 a day. That was $48, and that was a big help. 
employees split six day work week between two, two families benefited. But he also impressed that the men wanted to work, they were willing to work, they would work at any job. And he uh, also stressed that the fact that he and other boys walked the railroad tracks picking up coal to use to heat in their homes. In an interview of 2017, Frank Toomer told me that he went hunting during the Depression. He had to do what he had to do when people were hungry. And he still remembered, he still had that picture in his mind of the animals that were lined up on the, on the string, on the line. So uh, this was stormy weather here in Montauk. However, although money was scarce, Fran Eckerd recalls having a lot of fun. She just had a lot of fun. She said that uh, she went boating and swimming and fishing and playing uh, simple games like hide and seek with her neighbors and friends. She said that our motto was to make do or do without. And she and her buddies really made do. This picture is New York City. <laughs> now, Perry, or Junie uh, Durier Jr. said the Depression, he also said it was a very tough time in Montauk. And he started working on the water uh, early in the 30s when he was about 11 years old. He had lobster pots, he went fishing, he worked for the uh, sea captains, as other youngsters did, he said, and he loved it. He loved the long days on the water, and then he liked getting together with all of his buddies at night and playing um, baseball. So also in the 30s, 1931, uh, Perry Sr. and Jane uh, took a chance and purchased E.B. Tuttle's uh, business. Mm, Perry said that it was a difficult, very difficult decision for them to make. Um, but they took the leap. They struggled, um, but no more than every, uh, other people. And so for those long years in Montauk, the Montauk people, you know, they uh, just dealt with the Depression with a lot of dignity, and they never remember, uh, never forgotten, like the, just the simple pleasures of life, you know, and just they, they just enjoyed it. And Fran Ecker said that they loved to be around family, and that a shared ice cream cone was an absolute delight, you know. <laughs> So while Montauk is dealing with the, uh, with the Depression, uh, there were stirring conflicts. Even though Americans kept to the grindstone, foreign leaders rolled on with aggression. And Japan invades Manchuria, and about a year later, the United States says, mm, we don't agree with that. But Himmler, March 20th, 1933, completes Dachau. And we all know what that meant. Three days later, Hitler becomes dictator. So I just changed one word here. Red sky at night, country delight. Red sky in morning, country take warning. This is when Hiroshi Seitu, Japan's ambassador to the United States, comes to the United States and declares that Japan will no longer agree to the uh, treaties, the Washington and the London. And um, that just meant that they could just build up their navy every which way they wanted, because that's what the agreements were to do, limit any naval uh, buildup. October 5th, 1937, FDR goes into, um, goes into Chicago. The idea he was going to dedicate one of his New Deal uh, projects that was very successful. Then he tells the, uh, the public that he saw material and spiritual gains as he traveled across the country. Then he veered into war talk. And this was the talk that went from neutrality to war preparation. That's in, in the United States. But what he did was he used phrases like 
reign of terror, haunting fear of calamity, vast numbers of women and children being ruthlessly murdered. Then he said if the uh, greed for power and supremacy goes unabated, all will be lost, wrecked, or utterly destroyed. And he warned us that if these things come to pass in other part of the world, let no one imagine that America will escape, that America may expect <coughs> mercy. However, the ill winds and stormy weather did not stop or retreat. So the Navy, as you expected, uh, for Japan, uh, it grew and it gave Japan a lot of confidence and strength and the winds blew stronger and more hateful towards America. However, in Montauk, in the midst of this grim war news, um, you know, there was a lot of light here. There was a lot of uh, excitement because the Montauk seniors in the graduating class of 1938, <laughs> well, they were rounding the corner and they were just thinking, okay, Summertime's coming. I, you know, first of all, we're going to get out of this school. Second of all, I've got new adventures, new plans. You know, I'm a lot of different exciting things. Sunday, June 26, 1938, in 2:30 uh, p.m. in the Edwards Theater in East Hampton, 46 graduates just cheered, and Perry Jr., 16 years old at the time. He was one of those graduates. Well, he um, worked on the water as usual in the summer, which was his love. And a interviewer from the Heritage Project asked him, now, did your parents encourage this work? No, they didn't. <laughs> they wanted him to go to college. He wanted to stay in Montauk and be a fisherman. Well, at the end of the summer, Perry Jr. very reluctantly, very reluctantly, uh, went to Colgate College and started his first semester as an economic major. Oh. Now, the war news. The war news was taking over most everything. Um, but Montauk listened to the news, but there was no Nothing about a storm coming, nothing at all. No warning. <coughs> September 9th, St a storm is brewing off of Cape Verde Islands in the mid-Atlantic, just off the coast of Africa. But Montauk folks, they were enjoying the fall weather. They went about their business. You know, um, businessmen did business, fishermen fished, Teachers taught, kids learned, and women, women did everything. But uh, a storm, nothing was said. Mid and uh, early September, mid-September, uh, in Montauk, things were good. September 15th, and the storm was moving slowly towards Puerto Rico. It was, it was a Category 5 hurricane. Then Florida was in its sight. Okay. okay. All right. And so storm veteran Floridians did what they know to do. They gathered necessities. They got boards for their windows. And some, of course, were making some maybe uh, evacuation plans. September 19th, the storm rapidly changed directions and rampaged forward alongside the eastern seaboard. The hurricane got jammed between two high-pressure systems that kept it from going out to sea. Long Island received no warning of this monster. No warning, no preparation. U.S. Weather Service believed the hurricane would stop once it hit Atlantic's cold water. Well, as we all know, no, it did not stop. It continued to barrel up the coast. Although Charlie Pierce told his bosses in the weather service it was going northeast, his warning was ignored. September 21, they started out nice. It was high tide, new moon, all terminal equinox, all which raised the water level, and then torrential rains. 
The speed of the howling winds added to the whirling Cat 3 hurricane, which had a speed of 50, then 60, then 90, and then uh, one report said sustained winds of 120. It slammed into Montauk in the afternoon with such a great force it was felt in Alaska. Montauk was under a surprise attack by horrific waves and winds, dropping trees, flying debris, smashed houses, loose boats, downed live wires, floating cars, and it was a shock, a trauma. Emotionally, uh, mentally, and physically, people were stunned. But then Montauk residents went into survival mode, and men uh, swam to rescue their families to the boats, uh, to the houses that were floating. Um, people, families, whole families uh, were fighting the winds to get, and the rains to get to higher grounds. Many people had to crawl. There is a, a story in um, the Historical Society's book that says, the name of it is Montauk, that a Mr. Mile and her dog Molly crawled to this restaurant and when she got there, they gave her a stiff drink. <laughs> and then they gave Molly a stiff drink, too. So, oh. so um, people escaping this water uh, boarded the train, but the train was stopped by the flood in Napique. Montauk was an island. Now, the conductor backed up to the station. Now, one report stated that the people were picked up at the station and driven to the Montauk Manor. Another report said the people off the train crawled to the manor. Our elementary children in the Montauk school were picked up by different families and kept safe. Now, uh, these different little snips of information, they come from that book, Montauk, which was published, I believe, 1997 by the Montauk Historical Society. The McDonald's house was split in two. They lost everything they owned. Water was ankle deep on the second floor of the Montauk Beach Company. One side of Dick White's drugstore blew off. Uh, Bill Salance had recalled that the pilings on Bonner's dock popped out like they were toothpicks, and then boats were swept away. His garage blew apart, and um, then in, in the, and his windows were smashed because of the flying wood, and then his house started moving towards Fort Pond, and it got stuck between two telephone poles, and so then the next day, uh, I'm not sure it was the next day, but soon after. Um, his icebox was found in the pond under the post office that had been pushed there by the wind and the water. Okay. He said there was utter destruction everywhere. Okay, um, Perry and Jane were in New York City struggling to get home. And in a letter to her sister-in-law, Jane wrote that she wanted to wait out the storm, but Perry wouldn't hear of it. He wouldn't even consider it. But they started home. Streets were flooded, full of debris and trees. Visibility was poor, but they finally reached Amagansett. Now, the water was too high to get to Montauk. Dorier tried it, but he had to turn back. Then. Um, a telephone worker told Dorier that Montauk was about wiped out. The dead and injured were at the, um, at the manor. So Dorier, he's like, what is going? So then he got a, a tractor, and he drove through the high water. Now, my understanding was he went there that night, and then somebody else said he went there the next morning, but he got there. And he had Dick Gilmartin with him and Dr. Norton. And once, um, once Jane got home, she found 50 to 75 storm refugees uh, sitting on her floor. She was told that the rest of the beach people um, were at the manor, and that's where Perry and the doc went. Okay. And then Perry, as town supervisor, he notified all emergency uh, agencies for 
aid right away, right away. So a tidal wave had flooded the entire Fort Pond Bay area. A day after a shopkeeper in East Hampton, uh, which I'm sure he got it from the radio because it was on the radio, that, the, uh, that there is no more Montauk. It's completely washed off the map. So you can imagine what those students thought. You know, my gosh, they were stricken and heartsick until they were driven back to Montauk and saw their families and saw the truth. Okay. okay. So there was, you know, you know, the 38 hurricane was a, uh, a real surprise attack. That's called stormy weather. <laughs> you know, um, but Montauk had great fortitude. They went right into recovery, and there was gratitude. But it's just like, like Perry a Senior said in his telegraph to emergency agencies, Montauk fish, uh, Fishing Village practically destroyed, number of boats lost, residents dist uh, destroyed, no water, light, or phone connections, and the fishing village wiped out. In his book, A Wind to Shake the World, the story of the 1938 hurricane, Everett S. Allen had this to say about Montauk. Montauk has been dealt a crushing blow, yet as disconsolate as its residents were, they were principally preoccupied with gratitude. Montauk went into recovery mode right away, right away. Uh, and they, men were on the beaches helping each other with their boats and houses, clothes were, uh, and other necessities were being gathered, food was being shared. You know, the storm was behind them, Great Depression still over them and recovery in front of them. Montauk did receive outside help, but the community circled the wagons and helped each other. According to an article in volume 20 of the Long Island Journal, it was the frontier spirit. So as cleanup, rebuilding, and starting over continued, the winds of war were whipping up. October 38, Bernard Baruch's report of his secret intel gathering is frightening. In essence, it tells it's useless to blockade Germany. The war machine is supplied to the hilt. Dominic Persiano, in his book, To Fill the Skies, says that Germans' mastery in the sky made it insurmountable. Charles Lindbergh says Germany cannot be defeated because of their superior aviation. Its, uh, its planes were technologically advanced, and their pilots were superb, extremely skilled. War preparation was imperative, and the need for planes and pilots acute in America. And Roosevelt starts the preparations. He sent Congress a message asking for $300 million for planes so that we could build planes just as good as what they had in Europe. December 38. Actually, at the very end of that December, Roosevelt signs the plans for civilian pilot training program. <coughs> Elliot Janway, in his book, In Struggle for Survival, confirms that in 1939, Germany commanded five bombers to Britain's one and 11 bombers to America's one. So this uh, civilian pilot training program did begin in 39, and Perry Jurier Jr. was one of their first students. This successful program, even though it had a lot of detractors for sure, um, this successful program trained John Glenn, women, and the famed Tuskegee Airmen. At this time also, Roosevelt sends second letter to Hitler seeking peace. Germany invades Poland, America stays neutral. Nineteen forty, the protests. 
they're getting a bit wild here against uh, going into an, another war. Protest is demanded, FDR's impeachment. People in America are fo uh, focused on their own recovery. Americans were tapped out from this depression. Uh, they just tapped out. And then, plus in Montauk, they had a hurricane. There were believers that Europe's problems needed to stay in Europe. September 16, 1940, the draft goes into effect for ages 21 to 36, men. November 26, 1941, uh, uh, the Japanese fleet of aircraft set off on a secret mission. It takes 11 days to get within the <coughs> optimal bombing distance to Pearl Harbor. Ishiroko Yamamoto masterminds this surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, and Prime Minister Hideki Tojo encourage it, seriously encourages it. Since 1939, uh, Japan had naval supremacy. Both men were convinced that Americans were too weak physically, too weak emotionally to recover from the destruction of, their, of Pearl Harbor. There was no fear of lazy Americans the harbor was bombed by 353 Japanese planes and 49 torpedoes launched in two waves. The first wave was 7.53 a.m., second 8.55 a.m., and by 9.50, all was over. 2,300 Americans killed. But as American ships were burning, the Americans' fighting spirit was also set on fire. The day after, U.S. declares war on Japan. December 11th, U.S. declares war on Italy and Germany because Italy and Germany declared war on us. And, and also, Hitler even had more disdain um, for Americans than uh, Yamamoto and Tojo. I had to edit his comments to make them, um, you know, Sunday talk. <laughs> America was a decayed country and its people were less than worthless. Hitler had no fear of America, no fear whatsoever. January 1942, American soldiers lapsed in Europe. Battles were horrific and the sights were unerasable in the minds of many of the fighting men. That it was um, terrible. October 42 draft is expanded to include ages of uh, men 18 through 37. However, here in Montauk, uh, Gene Beckman Jr. didn't want to wait. And with his mom's permission, he uh, enlisted in the Navy at 17. And he uh, served in both uh, D-Day in Normandy and Okinawa, two really hot spots. Of course, the environment here also um, enlisted in the Navy because the Navy took over much of the East End. Montauk um, Manor became a military base. The tower was barracks. Fort Palm Bay became a seaplane base and a, a torpedo testing facility. And Camp Hero had long-range uh, artillery. Here is a picture of one of the seaplanes that Durier flew. He graduates at Colgate in 42 with um, both pilot and instructor licenses. He excels. He is asked to stay on to, tra uh, to train Navy commissioned officers, and he does for a four, uh, few months before 21 training planes go up in flames, totally burnt. Itchy to get into uniform, he uh, enlists in the Navy the next day. Uh, after special training, he flies uh, seaplanes in the Naval um, Air Transport Corps. He flies the two-engine Martin Mariner 
and then the four engine PBY2 consolidated Coronado and that has a crew of 10. So the Coronado crews transport equipment, supplies, personnel, and extracts the severely wounded. Durier flies 180 hours a month. When asked by Carol McDonald here in an interview where he flew in the Pacific, he replied, you name it. The seaplanes followed marine land assaults one to three days. Oh. And like many members of the greatest generation, when I, I read through you know, his interview and watched his DVDs, and, and he said very little about what he saw or experienced. His focus was on the Marines and the soldiers on the ground. So when he was asked, he just very delftly uh, deflects and tells a few stories. So I chose these two stories because it highlights his personality. You know, they are, I find them to be interesting, but it really shows uh, uh, a lot about him and, and how, what he does. Okay, I call this story um, a Dinner in the Waves. Uh, Wallace is a rainy and stretchy uh, land of about 30 square miles in its rocky volcanic soil. There are some marines on the island, but most units have been pulled off. So at one, on one trip, he is flying from New Caledonia to Honolulu, and he's flying the two-engine Martin Mariner, and that Mariner uh, loses one engine. Well, he's got about 3,000 more miles to, to fly, and he's like, uh-uh, I'm not taking the chance. It's too chancy. I'm, gonna, I'm going to land um, on Wallace. Well, his crew didn't like it. Because Wallace was like uh, not a place you want to go to because its bat population was uh, more than all of those Pacific Islands added together. So no, they didn't want to go there, but he landed there. And uh, so after they uh, radioed in to get a new uh, engine with uh, mechanics to put it in, uh, they uh, were told that they're going to stay a couple of nights there. Well, they were really edgy. So uh, Dorier convinced a Marine on shore to lend them a reaming boat. He then got a bed sheet, put a line and hooks on it, and made a Japanese feather. Dorier and the men went out with two to three hand lines and caught about 15 tuners weighing, um, I, I think it was 25 to 30 pounds each. So he filleted them. Then they got one of those, those military big frying pans, fried them up. And uh, so they were going to have a great dinner on the, on the beach. But it was also made a little bit better because he secured five uh, cases of beer. <laughs> so... So indeed, they had, a, they had a good time. It also relaxed the men, you know. They weren't always looking around for bats. So um, and that seemed to do the trick. However, you know, those uh, mechanics come flying in to replace the engine didn't take them long. They were either there the next day or the, the day after. So if you're going to say, well, how, how did Perry know? There are tuners there? Yes, he did figure there were tuners in that water because he's from Montauk. <laughs> <laughs> so, so again, uh, in another interview with Carol McDonald, and this was in 2002, um, it, she asked, was, well, was there any uh, experience in the Pacific that stood out to him? Yes, Saipan. It was a mission that remained with him for almost, you know, 58 to 60 years. And it was tough, he said, taking out the early wounded. So um, he didn't add this, but I did, that the battle for Saipan began on June 15, 1944, fought nine days after uh, Normandy landing. And, uh, the, and it started at 5.30 in the morning. So 
you know, the United States, they heavily shelled, they bombed the, the, the beaches, they made way f for the Marines, and they were told, you know, I think we're good to get there. No, pro no problem there. I thought, gosh, that's a lot of firepower rained down. So I can't say that the Marines actually thought it was a cakewalk, but they were a little, you know, not so fearful, let's say. And um, instead, they were met with hor horror because the Japanese were stuck, uh, you know, they were embedded in the cliffs above the beach and had been watching the, the Marines all along. So when I saw this in a documentary, they were just waiting for them. And then what they did was they just let loose with their firepower, cut them down, and the Marine uh, uh, dead in just that, uh, just that one day, 2000. So Duryea, under orders, went, went in there to take out the severely wounded. Yeah. Uh, well, they, the Marines did run for cover, but unfortunately, there wasn't that much cover, you know. So he went in the, uh, the next day and extracted the severely wounded. And Duryea and, of course, the other seaplanes, the, the pilots and crews, uh, they took out 40 to 50 of the worst wounded on every trip, and the trips were circular. Saipan <laughs> Hospital, Saipan Hospital. So it, it stuck with him, yeah. So um, as we know from history, Saipan and the Marianas was one of the bloodiest and costly battles. The Japanese desperately needed to secure that because because if they lost Saipan, then it gave the Americans a clear shot to mainland uh, Japan with the new um, <coughs> aircraft, the B-59s. But, However, when Perry was talking about Saipan, he did not mention any of this. True to his personality, um, he didn't say anything about the wounded the stench of death, or the thousands of bodies of men, women, and children who had committed suicide that were just floating in the waters. And that was by the encouragement of Emperor Hirohito. No other option but victory. Do not surrender to Americans. So what Dorier tells us about Saipan, um, about his college friend, Johnny Greer, and I call this the, tra uh, the Brotherhood of the Traveling Can of Crab Meat. So on one trip to Saipan, uh, the Marine boss uh, came to inform Perry when, you know, the wounded would be loaded onto his plane. And he, they, he also warned him that uh, the Japanese are uh, swimming out with hand grenades, pulling the pins, and throwing them into the seaplanes. And he told Doria, listen, tell your men if they see anything that looks like a floating coconut or a bobbing coconut, just shoot them. So he said, yes. Okay. But then he asked about his friend Johnny Greer, who hit the beach with the uh, uh, 2nd Marine Division. The Marine happened to know Greer and know where he was, and he agreed to take uh, Perry onto the beach, and then bring him back to the plane. So Perry grabs a bottle of scotch, goes in, finds Greer, gets in his foxhole. He says, hi, John, came to see you. Well, Greer is going, what are you doing here? And uh, Perry just hands him the scotch. So Greer says, well, OK, I've got a can of uh, crab meat. And so he opens the can of crab meat, and he tells Perry about the story. He said that the, this can was packed and shipped to Japan. Japan ships it to Saipan, and Greer got a hold of it when they overran the position. So, that, uh, so Perry said they had a whiff of scotch and a little bit of crab. And it, it, was, a, it was a nice thing. You know, it was like a humanizing touch there. And then uh, it was very short visit, but then Perry got um, back to the plane, took the wounded to Honolulu. 
so that was uh, so Americans were victorious on Saipan. It, it opened up the the way for B 29s um, but the victory came. It was steep. The price was 3,500 American deaths and over 10,000 wounded in just three weeks and three days of fighting. So war continued to rage on the other islands and in Europe at a high cost of American lives. There was uh, 418,500 Americans who lost their lives in World War II in total. So, what? The war ends, the storms are over, VE Day was May 8th, 1945, VJ Day was August 14th, 1945, and the uh, war is officially over on September 2nd, 1945, when the Japanese uh, signed the surrender documents on the USS Missouri. So the people of Montauk went through the deprivation of the Depression, the destruction of the 38 hurricane, and the unknown uh, of World War II with an intrepid spirit. And this spirit is what brought America victory. And the stormy weather was finally over. The winds were calm. The waters were calm. And Montauk was victorious. So this is, I think you recognize them, <laughs> Jane Perry Sr. And, and Perry Jr. And it just wanted to, um, you know, end with this. Uh, and, uh, but, but that intrepid spirit, even though Perry had it, but he got it here. And he got it from his community. Do you know, and this actually, this uh, fortitude is Montauk. Uh, but Perry, I have is is that he did love people. He really enjoyed people, and I know that there are many people that loved him. He liked being around people, and there were people who liked being around him. So no matter what he did or where he went, he had Montauk in his heart. Heart. He never forgot the people of Montauk. Um, this is a Montauk person telling me this. He never forgot um, Montauk, and Montauk was his first and lasting love. Perry said on numerous occasions that the three things he always loved was sea, air, and water. He was proud to be from Montauk. He loved his community. He said it was real. It was a real community. He had both the same frontier spirit and strength and can-do attitude of the community and demonstrated in a way the way he treated people with value in his leadership with, uh, uh, in the war, business, and politics and his dignified manner when he was battered by false charges and derailment of aspirations. Perry was a reflection of his parents. He was sp smart and witty like his mom. He was generous and a giver like both of them, and he was a speaker of more than ordinary ability and an aggressive fighter like his dad was in politics. <clears throat> Perry had a charismatic personality. He was fun to be around, and, and as I say, people liked being around him, and they liked being liked by him. He had a good sense of humor, with his use of words and his contagious laugh. And I loved it when I saw the DVDs and he was laughing, you know, in these interviews, he's laughing and his shoulders are laughing right with him, you know. But he was one of a kind, one of a kind. And one person um, said in an interview that I read that they just don't make him like him anymore. So that's it. Uh, so I hope that you enjoyed it, and enjoyed the talk. I'm so pleased that you all came. And that, does anybody have any, any questions or anything you'd like to ask? And I'm sure my brother will be glad to answer you. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> no, you can't talk. No, you can't talk. <laughs> uh, yeah, so. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. It's really a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.